Growing up as a little kid, I used to think all Lutheran churches were the same. We're talking same liturgy. Everyone's favorite hymn was number 200, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And when it came time to singing the Psalms, the entire congregation would chant it with as much enthusiasm as an orphanage on Mother's Day, which isn't good. Then something changed at uh, my lifelong Lutheran church. I don't know if maybe it was just me paying more attention, but sermons stopped being about how Christ was reaching out to sinners, and instead it seemed more about um, uh, pastors preaching out to what was wrong with sinners at other wayward Lutheran churches. And uh, these Lutheran churches, um, they would do sinful things like accept females to be preachers or they wouldn't condemn same-sex couples. Either way, I just remember thinking, thank God uh, that I go to the one true church and that I'm in the right and I'm going to heaven. And thank God that I'm not like one of these other churches who are on a highway to hell. Um, sadly, to a certain extent, um, when I would leave those Sunday services, I often felt spiritually superior, if that's, if that's a term. Um, and then they called me out too, and then that, that kind of changed everything. But who were these other wayward Lutheran churches? Well, one weekend, through after a series of weird circumstances, I went to the extreme and visited a quirky Lutheran church in a trendy Denver neighborhood. Word had it that they had a chocolate fountain baptismal font, and I didn't see that. But what I did see is when I walked in, there was a portrait of Elvis welcoming me. I was handed a bulletin from a trans woman who, as I later learned, was looking to become ordained as a minister herself. And when it came to communion, uh, rumor had it a ex-convict had once distributed the body and blood of Christ uh, to a congressman. And... when the service ended, I was outside uh, drinking some fat tire beer in a red Solo cup, eating pizza, um, talking with some queer couples as the female preacher, covered from neck to toe in tattoos, led a procession called the Blessing of the Bicycles, which basically blessed any mode of transportation, including crutches, that wasn't a gas-guzzling automobile. Turned out, not all Lutheran churches are the same. So, my name is David Boyce. I am the author of a book called 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. Uh, You can find it on Amazon. Uh, The book chronicles my one-year experience uh, becoming an intentional church hopper. Um, trying to remain unbiased as I challenged what I had been conditioned to believe about everything, especially when it come when it came to church. So the last video, and I'll put the link below. Uh, we explored what happened 500 years ago in Germany when an outlaw monk named Martin Luther nailed it when it came to. Uh, throwing out his BS card uh, against the Roman Catholic Church. So he just threw out his BS card. This is mine. Um, I've used it uh, never. Um, But basically, with a BS card, if someone is more full of it than a bull on X-Lax, that's when you throw out your BS card. Martin Luther threw it out in the form of 95 Theses. And what that did is he became an overnight you know, celebrity in Germany at that time. And he used his newfound popularity to challenge the status quo of the Roman Catholic Church, some of the questionable practices that they were doing to raise money. 
And overall, it sparked the Protestant Reformation that splintered off all the different types of Christian denominations that you see today. Today, we're not going to go into a history lesson. Uh, I'm going to talk about my own unique experiences uh, with visiting different uh, Lutheran churches, or like I like to call them, Lutheran sub-denominations. So, uh, now there's a disclaimer I got to put in the front of this video. Um, there's other Lutheran pastors and theologians uh, that are on, on YouTube. Um, they possess impressive book collections in their background. Uh, that obviously shows how much smarter that they are than me. And uh, they are, I guess. Um, but um, me, I don't have an impressive book collection in my background. I, I just got, I got a pillow. And I just stole that from my living room just so that corner looked like I knew what I was doing when it came to home interior. But I don't. So um, Now, compared to other Lutheran um, pastors, theologians, I'm coming at this from a different angle. Um, I'm a guy who's Lutheran church, and I'm going to say a bad word here, I pissed him off. And I was trying to figure out, um, did I even need church? Um, I also had a lot of friends, a lot of family members who also had abandoned their traditional churches, had abandoned their faith. And I was left to contemplate what what's wrong what is causing so much so many people to leave these traditional churches and um i basically just became a guy who sat in a new pew each week um just to see what i'd be welcomed as for a first time visitor so nothing special so let's get into this what is it like at a lutheran church well, the answer depends what Lutheran church you go to. Uh, first, I'll just kind of give you some similarities. Uh, to an outsider, uh, the Lutheran church probably looks like Catholic light. Um, each service has a liturgy. Um, what the, the liturgy is, is it's usually in the form of a bulletin that scripts out the worship service to the congregation. So they're on cue for whatever's going to come next. Uh, the service is littered with several hymns uh, that were typically written 400 years ago. Uh, organ music, piano, you're not going to see a whole lot of um, trendy fog machines or, you know, bass guitars. Uh, more, more, those are more the progressive ones, but for the more conservative, you're not going to see that too much. Um, the, there's usually three readings uh, with a 20-minute sermon. And throughout the service, you just stand, sit, stand, sit, stand, sit. And that, I think, just keeps the blood flowing. Um, from my experience, every service can be very similar in how the liturgy works. So when the congregation has to chant something, um, it's because you do it every week, the congregation tends to go on autopilot through the motions, and there, it just loses some vigor from my own experience that you typically will not see at uh, the modern-day churches. So I talked about Catholic light. So the Catholic Church has seven sacraments. When Martin Luther created uh, the Lutheran Church, he found two sacraments to be important. Um, for me, so the two sacraments, it's baptism and communion. Uh, for me, growing up in a strict Lutheran church, baptism was pretty easy. Um, I was three weeks old when I was baptized. I don't remember too much about that. Um, most babies with Lutheran parents, uh, they get baptized pretty early in life. Um, it's almost like a spiritual... Um, vaccination uh, to avoid hell, you know, if something something weird happens. For communion, that's held every other week. That entailed a lot more than 
uh, what happened when it came to baptism. Uh, for me, I had to go through three years in grade school uh, learning um, the Bible and Martin Luther's, uh, I think it was a small catechism. And the final test required me and my fellow students to appear in front of the entire church body, and our pastor would grill us, and basically to test us if we knew what we had learned. Um, once you passed, you were given permission, or confirmed, to attend Holy Communion. So that was, that was different. Within the United States, um, there's several sub-denominations. Um, last I looked, there are about nine, uh, each that have about 10,000 plus members each. I'm not gonna go into all of those. Um, the differences can come down to the inerrancy of the Bible. Um, you know, do you believe in creation versus bang bang theory? Or if women can be ordained as pastors? Over the past few decades, um, especially the last decade, uh, new cultural challenges have arisen, and that has challenged how some churches approach that. So, for instance, views on abortion. Um, if homosexuals or transgenders can be ordained as preachers. Uh, the biggest one in the last decade it has been, and well, has gotten the most press, is... Um, will, will Lutheran churches participate in same-sex marriages? Um, as a result, the different sub-denominations uh, can look pretty political uh, when you see those side-by-side. Side. Politics, yay! Let's stay away from that. So I'm going to focus on the three largest sub-denominations uh, the biggest one is the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. It's often shortened to ELCA. The ELCA has, I want to say, about 10,000 churches within North America and over 3 million members. They are more, uh, they're more on the progressive side from what I've seen. Um, they can change more with the culture. I'm going to cover ELCA later, but what I'll cover next is the, the second and the third biggest ones, and they're pretty much the same uh, from the conservative end. The second largest church, it's the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, they're often abbreviated to LCMS. I just like to call them Missouri Synod. They have about 6,000 churches and 2 million members. They are much more on the conservative side. Number three, I grew up in the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. That's more commonly referred to as Wells, W-E-L-S. And Wells has about 1,300 members and about over 300 to 400,000 members. Honestly, from what I experienced and from what I've researched, Missouri Synod and Wells are pretty much the same. Um... From what I understand, it, like imagine two denominations dating each other. Like they would hate, like Wells and Missouri Synod, like they were together for about 50 years with, I want to say, two other sub denominations. And then something weird happened where the Missouri Synod was accepting of Boy Scouts, like in the 50s or something. I can't remember the whole thing. There's a guy on YouTube called Dr. Jordan B. Cooper. The dude has a magnificent beard, okay? And a much more impressive book collection than what I got here with my pillow. Anyway, he goes into the full stuff on that. But basically, Wells got jealous that Missouri Synod was allowing some other denomination to into fellowship. Wells was like, all right, we're breaking off. Missouri Synod is like, fine, they break up. And even though they're almost exactly the same in how they do services and how they view things, they're still split to this day. So whatever. So when it comes to uh, this video, I'm just going to kind of group Missouri Synod and Wisconsin Synod into one. So when it came to the visits that I made, um, and, and I'll go into the conservative side first, 
When it came to Missouri Synod and Wells, I entered the 52 Churches in 52 Weeks project with a bit of a chip on my shoulder. And that all boiled down to closed communion. So when it comes to the conservative Lutheran churches, if you want to receive communion, the back of the bulletin will basically address the, con the congregation that it's only members invited. There will be a little section that says, hey, if, you didn't, if you're not a member and you didn't speak with the pastor earlier in the week, you cannot attend communion. Um, one example for me, um, I, I dated a girl for a number of years, uh, probably my healthiest relationship I've ever had, and her dad was a guy I respected a ton. And one service, um, and they went to Missouri Synod Church, and I was Wells. The family went up for communion, but I had to stay back. And even at the time, like, like, like we felt like family. And it just felt really weird to split us up. So after the service, the dad went up to the pastor, and I still remember it to this day. And he basically questioned the pastor about it challenge the doctrine, like, you know, we need to change that. That's, that's not right. And, you know, nothing was going to be done about it, but I just respected that he stood up to the doctrine and because it just didn't make any sense why we had to be split up. We were both, we were all Lutheran. We all believed in God. Why, why was I disinvited um, based off what the bulletin said? Um, Later, during the 52 Churches in 52 Weeks project, I did visit a Missouri Synod church, and, you know, I looked at the back of the bulletin, saw that, you know, I couldn't go up, and it just, and I walked out, like I took off during communion. My reasoning was, why, why stick around? Like, you're going to have this country club Christianity where communion is treated like this righteous privilege, where only the members can go up. And, you know, if I'm a visitor, whether I'm a believer or a non-believer, um, am I, I'm just supposed to sit there, sit still for 20 minutes and just see everyone else go up there. Um, it, it just, I didn't get it, you know? And that's one of the problems I often saw when I went to my old Lutheran church, a communion would roll around, and a lot of the non-members would, there'd just be this mass exodus at the end of the service where people would just take off early. And there would always be this split uh, within the church. It just, you know, for the Last Supper, it should be held in high esteem. And it just looked terrible when so many church goers would, you know, hit the road. So... And I think when it comes to communion, that was the biggest thing for me. If you're invited into someone's house, you're welcomed at the door, and you're felt to be included. But when it comes time for dinner, now you're denied. Now there's no seat for you at the Lord's table. That's what always bothered me so much. And that's where, where I, I had a question like, why... Why deny anyone communion that wants Christ, that wants what Christ was all about when it came to the Lord's Supper? And the only answer I found um, from the, I want to say it was the Missouri Synod's um, stance on that, was communion was to preserve the integrity um, of witnesses to the gospel. What does that mean? So to me, it just, as it kept snowballing in my head, it just, it just had these Pharisee-like vibes to it in terms of why it was members only. And that's, you know, Jesus still invited Judas uh, and dipped bread with him at the Lord's table. And, you know, Judas picked his own path. Um, Jesus didn't pick it for him. So why do church bodies, why do pastors, why, why do they get to pick who receives and who doesn't? 
it's only Christ that can see our hearts. So why, why does the church body do that? I don't know. So now this is a sharp contrast to what I experienced at the ELCA churches. My very first visit uh, during 52 churches in 52 weeks, it was at a church where um, they actually did invite everyone up to communion. And at the time when I visited, I had no idea, no difference between ELCA, Missouri Synod, Wells. I didn't know the difference. And when everyone was invited, I didn't go up. Um, I had been so conditioned that you had to be a member of the church body uh, to be accepted. And the third week I attended, I had a big epiphany. And it was at another ELCA church. This one was in the middle of a, of a farming community. And that church, instead of a sermon, uh, the pastor actually invited another pastor on stage. And they dressed up as Martin Luther and Martin Luther's best friend. I want to say, his you know, again, this is where I need a book collection to remember the names. Uh, Philip Melikathon. I'm not even going to try. Uh, I just remember, hey, this this little role play that they're doing, this is really neat. And they're all dressed up. They're presenting solid arguments in terms of why they did the Protestant Reformation, why they were challenging the Catholic Church at that time. And the thing that stuck out for me so early on was what one of the pastors said. And he said this, the church is always in need of reform and change. And after the debate, they held communion, and the pastor invited everyone up, and he made it clear you, it didn't matter if you're a member or you're a non-member. And I decided to go up, you know, try and challenge what I had been conditioned to believe about communion my entire life. And, you know, the pastor asked my name. I told him David, and I can't remember what he said, but he gave me the bread, he gave me the wine, and he blessed me. He blessed everyone at that table. And um, I was ecstatic. And I know that sounds probably silly, but for me to be accepted like that, um, where I could be a believer, I didn't have to um, jump through any jump through any hurdles or, well, jump over any hurdles or jump through hoops or anything like that, they took the word of who I said I was in my belief in God, and that was good enough to be served at the Lord's table. And um, that that was a game changer for me. So now I still didn't know too much about ELCA until I drove out to that Denver neighborhood to experience uh, the church called the House for All Sinners and Saints. And they were social justice warriors. Uh, they were queer inclusive. Um, they were tattooed hippies for Jesus. And they kind of combined, um, you know, trendy, uh, modern type of way of thinking with these traditional type of slants uh, for the Lutheran faith. And, you know, as I'm sitting by myself, um, you know, the guys, I'm, guys behind me are talking and, you know, they're, they're dropping F-bombs every other word. And I'm just like, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. Um, I wasn't ready to go to that level yet, but there are a lot of things that I experienced at that church that changed my perspective and challenged my conditioning when it came to how churches welcome female preachers or um, how you welcome gays and lesbians and other type of stances that are more progressive of this world. And, you know, I, I still go back and forth on my stance regarding that. Um, and, you know, I'll save those thoughts for a later video. But that said, the Lutheran Church had... The House for All Sinners and Saints, I can't explain it, but they could take 400 old year old hymns and chants, I, I think it was called the, the Kyrie chant, 
like Lord have mercy. And it was fun. There was no type of monotonous droning chant going on that I'd been so accustomed to uh, at any kind of conservative Lutheran church I'd been to. This had soul. Like this had like just hymns, like people would just start singing on cue, but it didn't sound like it was on cue. Just people would just voice and everyone would join in. It was just so this acapella type of passion uh, in their singing. So yeah, it, it was just something else. So for me, part of me still identifies as a Lutheran. I just don't feel like I'm Wells. I don't feel like I'm Missouri Synod. And parts of me aren't ready to completely dive into ELCA either uh, when it comes to some of their stances that are more of the world. Um, ELCA says the church needs to keep changing. They, keep, they need to keep reforming. And Missouri Synod and Wells is like, no, no. The only reform and change that was needed was in 1517 from the Catholic Church. We're good. No more change. And I haven't come to a final conclusion myself on that. Like on one end, um, now that society has shifted more progressively, where it seems like identity is very... Um, mixed with your sexuality. It, it almost feels like your sexual identity and your significant other has replaced Christ um, as a God in itself. I can't fully get on board with that. Um, I think that's a little too progressive. Um, it's just too extreme for me. And, you know, I, I circle my toes in the water. I just can't cannonball into that water yet. I mean, there's a lot written in the Bible, uh, especially with Paul's letters to the early church, that that warns about to bodies bodies of the church and what they can contract uh, if you go too much of the world. Um, at the same time, um, I appreciate that there are churches who do reach out, who do cater. You need the church to be like Jesus. You need to reach out and welcome people of all different type of backgrounds. Um, we're all as screwed up as Mary Magdalene, you know? So I go back and forth. Um, on the other end, uh, when it comes to the conservative churches, uh, they have not helped with regards to condemnation in the past. And I think that was one of the biggest turnoffs I learned uh, when it came to you talking with friends who had left similar churches. I just remember hearing too many sermons or seeing too many videos where the conservative type of Lutherans will pray for the ELCA or will pray for other type of wayward churches. And it's almost like they're praying, come back to Christ. Um, you don't really know what the Bible means. And where, wherever I hear that, uh, it just feels more like a Pharisee-like message that's really saying, hey, we're, we're spiritually superior at our church compared to you. So, um, but yeah, it just, it turned me off. It turns other people off. It's similar to uh, what happened with the Catholic Church that sparked the Protestant Reformation, in my view. Uh, you're just adding things on. You're adding things on that was paid with Christ's death and resurrection at the cross. And it's almost like you're adding debates you're adding um, things that overcomplicate the message of Christ. And it, it, it makes more people question how to be saved. And it muddies the waters of grace. So as Lutherans, if you believe Martin Luther, that Christ paid the price for sins at the cross, like why? Why is there so much, why is there such a serious problem with what you think of how other Lutherans sin. So, so yeah, that's what turned me off, and that's kind of why I left the, cat, the Lutheran church. So, my name is David Boyce, uh, author of 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. Uh, if you like the, this video, hit the like button. If you want to stay up to date, uh, hit the subscribe button, and that will help the YouTube algorithm do good things for you. 
So thanks for watching.